Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, uh, I'm going to be working on something that uh, is actually, fun fact, one of the very first beers that I ever brewed, and that is a Belgian Golden Strong Ale. Um, those are fun beers. <laughs> uh, at least here in New England, it seems like things are starting to kind of open back up again. It seems like life is starting to work its way towards becoming a little bit more back to normal. So hopefully that is also the case where you are. I'm going to continue putting out these brewing videos just as regularly. So hopefully they're providing some source of entertainment for you and uh, helping you to be able to pass the time during this time. So way back when I started brewing, this is actually one of the very first kinds of beer that I actually tried to make. Um, and it's because I really had a love affair with uh, the beers of Brewery Omegang. Um, which is a fantastic Belgian style brewery uh, in Cooperstown, New York that puts out some phenomenal beer. This Belgian beer is actually what got me into craft beer when I started having beer. So some pretty classic examples of a Belgian Golden Strong Ale would be beers like Duvel or La Chouf. And uh, both of these are not triples, but actually Golden Strong Ales. There is a little separation between the two styles, although they are incredibly similar. It's kind of hard to tell the distinction between the two of them, but for the most part, the Golden Strong Ale is a slightly stronger, slightly drier, slightly simpler beer. Apparently enough of a distinction for a completely separate BJCP category uh, for Golden Strong Ale. But regardless, uh, both of them are great beers, very similar, uh, and can be brewed in the same way. But, you know, the, I think the main distinction is probably in the recipe, where Golden Strong Ale is pretty much just going to be Belgian Pilsner malt and some sugar. Uh, whereas a triple could have a lot more uh, specialty malt in it, something like a Vienna malt perhaps, or some aromatic malt, uh, melanoidin malt, something like that. But this is actually a really simple recipe. I mean, it is literally single malt, single hop, and then some sugar on top of it. So, uh, pretty easy to formulate. Um, it should be a relatively simple brew day, hopefully. <laughs> The fermentation, however, is where it's going to be a little bit more complicated, uh, and that's that's really what makes this beer. Uh, the yeast, like in a triple, the yeast is uh, really what makes the beer have that really spicy, aromatic, pear, peach kind of Belgian quality. So we're literally just using 13 pounds of Belgian Pilsner malt. Um, and then later on in the boil, about 10 minutes from the end, I'm going to add a pound and a half of cane sugar or table sugar. Um, you can use clear candy sugar if you wish, but it's going to do the same thing that just regular table sugar uh, would do. And that's not just me being lazy. There's actually a reason for that. Belgian candy sugar is a simple sugar that is already broken down to its simplest state um, so that it is easier for the yeast to ferment. Belgian candy sugar is a combination of fructose and glucose. Both of those are very simple sugars which have been broken down to very small molecules which are very easy for the yeast to consume. Table sugar on the other hand is sucrose which is a more complicated sugar which is going to need to be broken down a little bit further before the yeast can consume it. So if you were to add sucrose to an already fermenting wort, uh, the yeast would actually have to work a little bit harder to break that down first into fructose and glucose and then ferment it. Um, and that could cause some off flavors. So if you add sucrose during the boil, the act of dissolving it in water and then actually hitting it with lots of heat uh, will break it down into those individual fructose and glucose molecules. So you effectively have the same stuff in the wort once it is ready to be fermented. So you pitch the yeast in and there's fructose and glucose in there instead of sucrose. Uh, so in most cases, if you're using some sort of clear candy sugar, you're getting ripped off. Uh, so just buy regular table sugar and use that. However, in the case where it's a dark candy sugar, that is a different situation because that actually has a significant flavor contribution and is important for brewing dark Belgian beers. So if you have a recipe that calls for a clear Belgian candy sugar, just use regular table sugar, you will be fine. For hops, I'm using three ounces of spalt, uh, which is actually a German hop, and so it's not exactly two style. Most people use something like Zaz or uh, Styrian Goldings, um, but you can use a German hop and a Belgian beer and have the same results. It should be fine as long as it's continental. Um, and those are going in at the top of the boil. The only reason I'm really using spalt is because I have it left over from an older brew, um, and I want to get rid of it before it goes bad. And those are all going in at the top of the boil, 70 minutes. So we're doing a 70 minute boil instead of a 60 minute boil just because I've got a lot of Pilsner malt in there. I want to make sure we get rid of all of the DMS that that could produce, which would taste pretty nasty in a nice pale beer like this. 
Uh, for yeast, I am using Saf Brew T58, which is a dry yeast. Um, once again, I'm in my dry yeast collection now. Uh, I don't like to order liquid yeast online because it can be exposed to heat for a long time during the shipping, especially in the summer. Um, T58, however, is a fantastic yeast already. Uh, T58 is the yeast that I use to brew my Belgian quadruple with. It has a phenomenal character, like just pear notes and spice and pepper and just, it was a really awesome yeast. I had a two-year-old packet of that, so I don't trust pitching a two-year-old packet of dry yeast into a high-gravity wort, so I went ahead and made a starter out of dry yeast packet, so <laughs> we should definitely have enough yeast now. Um, so for water, um, my water profile does have kind of high ion counts. That's because I'm just using my city's water profile as a base, not reverse osmosis water. I don't have a setup for that. So don't copy my water profile to be exactly what it is unless you like live in my city. The thing to pay attention to with the water profile is just making sure that you have about a two to one ratio of chloride to sulfate ions. That's just going to help accentuate the malt character of the beer and keep it uh, complex and interesting. If we flip that around and we had more sulfates than chlorides, um, then we'd be emphasizing more of the hop bitterness. But since that's not the focus of this beer, we're not going to do that. So my profile is 37 parts per million of calcium, 7 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 69 parts per million of sulfate, uh, 111 parts per million of chloride, and 36 parts per million of bicarbonate. Um, and I'm adding 4 grams of gypsum, 1 gram of calcium chloride, and 1 gram of Epsom salts to my mash water in order to achieve that profile. Now if you're interested in learning more about how water chemistry works or affects your beer, I've done a video on that. It's kind of old now, but I'll leave a link up here in the corner for you uh, to check that out if you want to. Um, I typically add all of my salts to a full volume of mash water, about 11 gallons, and then I let off about 2.5 to 3 gallons for sparge water later. That way all of my water that I use is treated with that water profile. I also treat it with half a Camden tablet, which helps to get rid of the chlorine compounds that might be in city water, uh, which can leave a nasty taste in your beer. Um, so I am mashing for 60 minutes at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is going to help promote a nice attenuative beer. One of the biggest characteristics of this beer is making sure that it is a very dry beer. Uh, adding the table sugar will help with that, but also mashing at a lower temperature is gonna help with that. So we're gonna try and mash around 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. So my water has been prepared, treated, and it is up to temperature now, so we're gonna go over and mash in. So I use this little recirculation system here to uh, ensure that my mash kind of stays at a pretty consistent temperature the whole time. Uh, it's not necessary at all to brew this beer. You can do fine with a regular single uh, igloo cooler kind of setup. Uh, but I just like this because it just provides a little extra measure of consistency for me. Uh, so now anyway, everything is all broken up and mixed together quite thoroughly. And there's no clumps, so we're going to go ahead and Restart the recirculation and hold this here at 150 degrees for an hour. All right, so now we've been going for about a full hour on the mash. So it's time to start collecting wort. Um, so what I typically do for this is just drain from this kettle into this kettle uh, for however much liquid we get out of that for our first runnings. And then um, I have some sparge water over here on the side that I heat up to about 170 degrees and then we can use that to sparge with uh, and then we'll let that sit, we'll recirculate on top of that for a while again and then we drain the rest of that into this, gal uh, into this kettle here. So the total capacity of this kettle is about eight gallons. So once it has reached the top of this, then we're typically good to go and then I can pump the wort that I collected uh, into the boil kettle after I take out the grain bag and all that stuff uh, and then we start the boil.
So here is our uh, pre-boil gravity sample, and it looks like it's about 10.8 bricks, which translates to a pre-boil gravity of 1042, which is only one point higher than the target of 1041. Okay, so we just reached the uh, start of the boil. So now we're gonna go ahead and add our, our bittering addition, which is this three ounce addition of spalt, and uh, that's going in now. So I don't really have to do anything for the next hour. Uh, we'll wait for 60 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes left in the boil, and at that point, we'll add our sugars and some other things. All right, so now we are 10 minutes from the end of the boil. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do now is add in uh, this, which is a crushed up mixture of a Whirlflock tablet, which is gonna help ensure we have a clear beer at the end of the process, as well as two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient. Then the next thing we're gonna do is gradually add in all of this table sugar. This is a pound and a half of table sugar. So the important thing to do is to add this in as gradually as you can um, to avoid uh, getting some caramelization buildup at the bottom. So you don't want a nasty mess of caramel in there. Uh, so make sure you stir everything up good. Break up those chunks that you know are here and just try to keep everything from uh, sticking. Another thing that's gonna happen around the 10 minute mark is just uh, a recirculating boiling wort through whatever chilling system you have. In my case, it's a plate chiller. So the boiling wort going through this uh, for 10 minutes is gonna guarantee that the inside of it is pretty sanitary, assuming of course that it's actually clean when you do that, because uh, if you have just chunks of things in there, it's going to be uh, a bad time. All right, so now it's time to begin the chilling process. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my uh, valves all adjusted. So I hope you can see that through the right combination of uh, slowing down the output of the chiller and the output of the pump and the input of the chilling water, uh, you can actually achieve a pretty fast chill. Um, it's gonna take a while to get down to around 60 or so, but uh, overall the chill does happen very fast, which is nice. All right, so while the chill is finishing up, um, I'm gonna talk about the fermentation really quickly. So with 90% of Belgian beers, they're made in the fermentation, absolutely. So uh, the yeast is you know, one of those defining signature characteristics of a Belgian beer. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because um, it drives a whole bunch of esters and phenols that we wanna extract. One of the defining characteristics of especially a Belgian Golden Strong Ale is a very dry finish. So what that means is we want it to ferment as much sugar as is possible uh, and get the lowest possible final gravity out of this beer. One way you can kind of hack your fermentation to ensure that you have as much attenuation as possible or get the driest finish possible is to start your fermentation off at a lower temperature. Uh, and we're actually gonna go for about 65 degrees the first day. Uh, and then every single day thereafter, ramp it up by one or two degrees Fahrenheit. So basically my plan then is over the course of about two weeks to ramp this from 65 up to 80 degrees. And that's just gonna ensure that the yeast don't have any sort of pitching related off flavors, which can happen if you pitch it too warm uh, at the beginning. And then it also ensures that as the yeast multiply and grow and are able to eat more sugars faster, you increase the temperature and therefore increase their activity and their metabolic rates, and that thereafter ensures that they consume as much sugar as is possible before they run out of food. All right, so we reached about 65 degrees coming out of the chiller, so I'm gonna go ahead and start transferring the wort over into the fermenter bucket. And uh, what I found to be the best way to uh, aerate your wort, which is important for yeast health and good fermentations, um, the best way to do that is, I think, to just splash it from a decent height into your fermenter so that it creates lots of oxygen bubbles and uh, dissolves a lot of that very important oxygen into the wort. All right, so now um, I decanted as much of this as I could, uh, but it still kind of was in suspension for most part. So uh, this is the starter that I made from that really old packet of T58. 
Um, looks like it definitely worked. So I'm gonna go ahead and pitch uh, this whole thing into the wort and then I'm gonna set this up with a blow off tube, I think. I get a feeling this is gonna be a pretty aggressive fermentation. All right, so here is our original gravity sample and it's about 16.2 bricks, which is a healthy 1065 for an OG. It's uh, three points short of our target at 1068, but that's okay. Uh, I expect this to ferment down pretty far. Uh, so here's our final gravity. It's been fermenting for several weeks and once it was done, I let it sit an additional week at 80 degrees just to completely finish out. Um, and it looks like we've hit our pretty much our final gravity. There is a little bit of temperature correction required with this sample right now, so it looks like our final gravity is gonna be about uh, 1.007, which is reasonably dry. All right, so fermentation actually went a bit differently than planned, um, and in a good way. So like I mentioned, we were gonna ramp that temperature all the way up to 80 degrees gradually over two weeks, right? So I ended up actually doing that whole process, ramping up to 80 degrees, uh, and then a circumstance came up where I had to leave home uh, here for about a full week. Uh, so I actually took advantage of that time and left the ambient temperature in the apartment at 80 degrees. And the effect of that was to completely guarantee that the beer reached the lowest final gravity that was possible. And in effect, I think it did create a more fully fermented, cleaner tasting and uh, drier seeming beer. Uh, so I'm pretty happy I did that. So anyway, I kegged it about a week and a half ago, so it's had some time to mature in the keg. And I think what we have here is a pretty interesting beer. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just pour it now and then we'll go outside on the deck and talk about it. All right, so it's called Home Wrecker uh, because it's a dangerous blonde. <laughs> and uh, it comes in at 7.7% ABV and 27 IBUs. And I'm pouring it kind of slowly because it is actually a uh, really highly carbonated beer uh, to style. So I don't want it to kind of be a glass full of foam here. As you can see, the color of the beer is a really nice kind of opaque, light, hazy uh, gold color. Um, it is, it's not dark gold, it's definitely not super light though, it's not Pilsner, you know, but uh, it's not as pale colored as perhaps a Belgian wit would be, but it's definitely not very dark gold either. So it's still definitely a pale beer, it looks really nice. Um, that haze is created by a lot of yeast in suspension, uh, which is gonna be critical for the flavor later on. Uh, the head on the beer is a really nice, compact, fluffy, tight white bubbled head, um, and it is, uh, it's really quite nice and luxurious. Um, as I mentioned, I carbonated the beer quite heavily, and in fact, it would be about three to three and a half volumes if you're really counting. And uh, that is characteristic of pretty much every Belgian beer style, but especially, especially the Belgian Golden Strong Ale. Uh, the higher carbonation level really does kind of accentuate the level of dryness that you experience when you taste the beer. All right, so moving on to aroma now. Sorry for any noise that's going on. My neighborhood's kind of active this evening, uh, but that's all right. So it has, first of all, very, very nice aromatics on this beer. Um, it smells heavily spiced, despite the fact that I added no spices to it at all. And it has everything to do with the Belgian yeast. Tends kind of more on the pear and almost even a slight tangerine note. Really fascinating. Um, I love Belgian yeast because it's just the most aromatic yeast out there, I think, in my opinion. You also get kind of like a wheat type of uh, freshness in the aroma. Um, and I'm not really sure where that's coming from because I didn't use any wheat whatsoever. There's also a considerable amount of clove and coriander-like spice coming through, which again, I didn't add to this beer. It's just amazing what the yeast can produce in terms of uh, esters and phenols. So now we'll go in towards mouthfeel. So as I mentioned earlier, this beer is quite heavily carbonated. So there's a significant carbonic bite. Um, to it as you take a sip it's going to kind of be a little bit harsh for some palates um, and it does kind of feel quite dry in the mouth it's a very light or medium bodied beer uh, with a very smooth um, mouthfeel which is surprisingly creamy um, but retains all of the lightness and the dryness it's actually kind of a fascinating combo. Uh, so typically when we say a creamy mouthfeel, we're talking more along the lines of like a New England IPA, which typically has like a medium full-bodied mouthfeel, but this guy is a medium light to light-bodied mouthfeel, still retaining that same, that same creaminess and smoothness on the tongue. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the flavor section. Mm. 
All right, so it's pretty good. So despite having a really simple recipe, just Belgian Pilsner malt and some sugar, spalt hops, and the T58 yeast, it has a very complex flavor. And it's one of my favorite things about Belgian beers in general. So first off, I think the most prominent flavors are probably like a pear and apple kind of flavor, similar to the aroma, but you also get like a white pepper kind of interesting note there. Along with some coriander, which also kind of has a pepper-like flavor, and um, a little bit of like a, some kind of citrus, maybe an orange or tangerine. Yeah, really nice kind of multi-dimensional first bit of flavor there. Um, it's really quite spicy and aromatic tasting. Uh, it's really dry. So that initial flavor goes away very fast. And uh, whatever's left over is that same creamy kind of wheat-like flavor, I guess. Um, I'm not 100% sure how to describe it, but it's, it's a malt characteristic. Um, but it's just really nice and creamy, kind of Belgian Whitbeer-like kind of... Uh, smooth flavor. Um, also present is a pretty strong kind of clove character, which um, could be a turn off for some people, I know. Uh, clove is a pretty strong flavor, uh, but it's not really overdone in this beer. I'm also getting like a lot of like a cardamom kind of character, which is really nice too. Um, obviously the beer is quite dry. I cannot stop talking about how dry it is, but there is a really substantial kind of like dry white wine character, almost not, not quite a champagne character, but just a dry white wine. So, you know, that kind of comes into play with the pear and the apple notes as well. Um, being a dry beer, it, it kind of has that characteristic. As far as like a, an overall score, <laughs> I'm going to probably give it like an eight. Definitely a couple things that I'm not super satisfied with. And the first of those things is that it does have a noticeable um, alcohol presence. So it's not like a fusel alcohol where there's a burning kind of fuel like flavor, um, but it's more of just like a, uh, it's an alcohol note that is, it should be covered up. Uh, Belgian beers and especially Belgian strong beers are notorious for being way stronger than they taste. And, and in those situations, that alcohol note, that alcohol presence is undetectable. Uh, the beer tastes like it should be a 5% wit beer when it's a 9.5% <laughs> Belgian Golden Strong Ale. Uh, what we have here is a situation where the alcohol is definitely detectable, it's noticeable, you know you're drinking a strong beer. It still doesn't taste and feel like it, but there's just that, that presence there. Um, and it comes through at the very front as kind of like a sharpness. Um, but it's not... I say again, it's not a fusel alcohol, it's not like a stressed kind of flavor where it's like drinking paint thinner. If anyone's ever worried that they have fusel alcohols in their beer, if you have a splitting headache the next day and your beer tastes like paint thinner, then yes you do. But in this case, it's not the case. The other thing I think I would change is adding some spices to this brew. Um, so right now the Belgian yeast is kicking off a lot of pepper and a lot of pear notes. I think those are the two most dominant flavors. Uh, but you can add some additional real spices to kind of complement those flavors. And I think adding a little orange and a little maybe like a seeds of paradise or a coriander type thing would be really interesting uh, in terms of adding a little bit of extra dimension to the flavor. Now adding spices probably would disqualify this from being a Belgian Golden Strong Ale, I think. I'm not 100% sure about that, but it would be an interesting idea. Yeah. Adding a little bit of orange peel would definitely complement the uh, pear and otherwise apple notes that this kicks off. And uh, adding additional spices, especially real ones, uh, would kind of help control that pepper flavor and give it a little extra interesting uh, dimensions. And it makes a pretty decent summer beer despite being pretty strong. Um, it just drinks very easily. It drinks at the level of a session beer. And, you know, in comparison to some of the other beers that I've got going right now, it definitely has a very refreshing quality to it. It was also definitely pretty fun to uh, revisit one of the very first styles that I ever made. Uh, I definitely think that this version of it is way better than the one that I made back then, uh, because I've definitely learned a lot since I first started brewing. Alright, so I think I'm going to go ahead and close out the video now. So thanks for watching all the way to the end. I do appreciate your views and your time. So if you like the video, please hit the like button. It does kind of help the channel become a little bit more visible to YouTube. And if you like watching this content uh, on a regular basis, hit that subscribe button. I will typically upload videos like this, grain to glass kind of style things, um, because that's the majority of what I do. Uh, but I also do some equipment stuff and technique stuff. Do you have any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, whatever on the process, comment down below. I will get back to you. I read every single comment and I get back to you as soon as I can. 
Also, let me know if you brewed the beer, uh, and sometimes you guys do that, and it's actually really cool when that happens, so uh, let me know what you think about it if you do. I will typically upload a video to YouTube roughly every two to three weeks, uh, depending on how fast I can brew and how fast I can empty kegs. Um, but if you're interested in more frequent updates, I have an Instagram, it's at the apartment brewer on Instagram, and there you can see more frequent updates as to what's going on and what might come to the YouTube channel within a couple weeks. Last but not least, there is a complete recipe down in the description box below if you're interested in making the beer for yourself the way I did. Also in the description box, I've included a complete list of all of my brewing equipment that I use as of filming this video uh, to brew beer with. And if you happen to be in the market for some equipment, there are some links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Just be advised that if you do click on one of those links, I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you, and it goes right back into supporting this channel. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer, and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.